Let's take a quick behind the scenes look at what is all involved with running a JavaScript unit test. So on the client side, as we know, we have HTML that gets loaded into the browser that then loads in all of our dependencies. Now these tests can be run in a separate iframe or a separate window to try to minimize the interaction between the code you're testing with the test framework itself. Now a lot of times when you're deploying code, it is bundled up and minified to be pushed into production. When we're running unit tests, we need the unminified and unbundled code so we could pick out just the exact minimum amount of code we need for our unit test. And then once this has all been loaded into the browser, when you want to rerun the test, you simply refresh the page. So for the most part, to make this all work seamlessly, you need to be running an HTTP server for various reasons. If you have any AJAX calls, of course you need it. If you want to do any live reloading of your tests, when something notices that a file has changed, you need a web server. And then of course, if your browser and your code are on different machines and you want to persist and display results in the terminal and not just in a browser, then you need a HTTP server. Now, of course, you should be using the simplest HTTP server possible. You should not be using your production web server for this. And some frameworks even provide a web server for you. Karma and JS unit are two examples of that. Now on the server side, it's a little bit more straightforward. We just have a single script that will find and execute all of our tests as well as load in the JavaScript that we need. It is nice if the tests also run in a separate Node.js VM, so there's no overlap or no pollution from any of the test code into the code you're testing. It's also a little bit simpler to re-execute your script when a file is changed using a file system watcher. And it's also possible if your watcher is smart enough to only exercise the exact test necessary to test the change it just detected in the file system. So let's just take a quick look at this. Here I have the Jasmine spec runner loaded up. Let's execute it. Wow, that was fast. So it ran five tests and there were no failures. And this is sort of the default view that Jasmine gives you when you're running browser tests via Jasmine. It will run all the tests, it will print out what it did, and assuming they're all successful, everything is green. If something fails, you get an ugly looking red thing there, so it's very obvious when something has failed. Here is the spec runner.html file provided by Jasmine for this example, and you can see it's doing all the things that we've been talking about. It has some sort of boilerplate HTML, it's loading in a style sheet and a bunch of Jasmine specific JavaScript right here to execute your test. Now it's loading in the files that are under test. And then finally, it loads up all of the test files to test those things. And then once everything is loaded up, Jasmine can now take over and execute all the tests found within this player spec.js file. Similarly, on the server side, there's a node version of Jasmine and it comes with a cli.js file which allows us command line access to execute the tests. Now the CLI here, we will be going into much more detail about this later, so I'm not gonna dive too deeply into it here, but all this really needs is the directory where all of your tests are. So in this case, it's looking in this spec directory, and when I execute this command, each one of those dots represents a test, and then F represents a failure, and once it's all done, it just prints out for me what all the tests had failed, what the stack trace was, if any, and then most importantly, the message provided by that test. 